Good, then I'll get started. Um, welcome everyone. I'm Jane Montanaro, Executive Director of Preservation Connecticut. I want to welcome you all, welcome you all this afternoon to our sixth installment of Talking About Preservation, Sustainability. This is a series of new, noontime forums that we've started doing in this COVID era as we're not able to be out in the field as much as we'd like to. So this is our way of um, reaching out to all of our members and supporters and engaging in some interesting preservation conversations. So Preservation Connecticut, um, we're the statewide nonprofit. We were formed as the Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation in 1975 by a special act of the Connecticut General Assembly. And we are statutory partners with the State Historic Preservation Office. Um, I'm on the call today, uh, Jane Montanaro, Executive Director, and we also have two of our circuit riders on the call, Brad Scheid and Stacey Vero. And our circuit riders are our boots on the ground. They are our field staff that goes out into the communities and meets with individuals and municipalities, organizations, um, developers, Anyone who is a steward of historic property and has a preservation puzzle that they need some help resolving. We are, we are here to serve you. And our mission, our mission um, is to protect, preserve, protect, and promote the buildings, sites, and landscapes that contribute to the heritage and vitality of Connecticut communities. And we do that through educational programs, and such as this, meeting with the, the public as we can on certain uh, platforms. And we like this particular platform because we can bring a different guest to you every week. And it's uh, wonderful to be able to bring a, a different array of experts and discuss different pres preservation topics with you each week. And we love the opportunity to talk with you as well and hear what's going on in your community or what particular project you're working on. Um, yourself and what resources we can bring to your project and to make a successful preservation project for you. So today's topic is sustainability and we're really excited to have our guest today, Marina Wisniewski from the Connecticut State Historic Preservation Office. And um, I'm gonna, the best thing to do is perhaps put your settings on speaker view. So then you'll see the slides and you'll see Marina speaking. And Marina, I'll hand it over to you. And I think that you will have control of the screen, but let me know if you don't and I will help you out. Uh, let's see, so I requested Approve. control. Okay. Approve. Perfect. All right, so, hello. <laughs> My name is Marina Wisniewski from the State Historic Preservation Office, and I'm going to show you the inherent sustainability of maintaining a historic home, as well as some ways you as a homeowner can improve the energy efficiency of your own. So it's a bit of a running joke that when people talk about sustainable homes, they think of something that's either a tree or a hobbit's den. But in actuality, most historic homes were built to be efficient by design, and if they are maintained on a regular basis, are quite sustainable. There is a lot of material that I'm going to go through in a very short amount of time, um, so it's going to be fairly broad, but more on each topic can be found on our website in our guide, Energy Efficiency for Historic Houses. So to start, as with most things, it's always good to begin with a plan. And in order to create that plan, we need to set our goals. Any house, new or old, is a system. The parts all work together, sometimes effectively, sometimes ineffectively. It's important to remember this when you are thinking what it is you want to accomplish by making your home more efficient. For most people, that would be lowering energy costs by reducing the amount of energy expended. In a house built prior to 1950, it is generally possible to improve energy efficiency by 30 to 40 percent, effectively making it as efficient as a conventional house built after 2000. For others, it's simply the idea of using existing resources to reduce the amount of waste that ends up in landfills. 
It takes an estimated 20 to 30 years for a new building to compensate for the energy expended for its construction. Most historic buildings have already expended that several times over. And for some people, their goals for improving energy efficiency also include keeping characteristics of their house that they love, their windows, their doors, their shutters, their radiators, things that they may have been told would need to be replaced in order to make their house green. That is simply not the case. There are many ways to go about improving energy efficiency in a home, and there's a lot of information offered. For, for historic homes, the goal is to improve energy efficiency while maintaining a home's historic integrity. As each resource is unique, it's important to know your home before you prescribe treatment. As we all know, historic properties come in many varieties, exhibiting different character-defining features. Something is character-defining, as defined by the National Park Service, if it is a visual aspect or physical feature that comprises the appearance of a historic building. Character-defining elements include the overall shape of the building, its materials, its craftsmanship, decorative details, interior spaces, and features, as well as the various aspects of its site and environment. This is a photo of 37 House Street, a contributing resource to the Dwight Street Historic District in New Haven. It is a circa 1855 Italianate row house. What would be considered some character defining features for this building, just based on the photo? Unmute yourself and, and give, give an answer. The window hoods on the windows, the cornice? Yeah, window hoods, cornice, great. Anybody else? The little roof over the door. Yep, like the door hood. Yep, right. Um, how about the brownstone lintels or those double hung two over two wood windows or even the brick? Yeah, all of these can be considered character defining. Some of those character defining features, while beautiful, are also practical and contribute to a home's passive efficiency. As an example, the shutters that most people keep fixed in place, they are actually meant to be used to shield and spear interior spaces from the sun, while also allowing breeze to pass through. Deep covered porches serve a similar purpose. Steep, dark colored roofs with little overhang are characteristic to many 18th century New England houses because of their ability to effectively shed snow and attract heat for warmth. As fuel was an ever-pressing concern for people who had previously been accustomed to mostly rainy winters, homes were designed to maximize heat retention from the roof line to the plan, which in the 18th century often centered the heat source in the middle of the structure, allowing heat to radiate out to each room. The vestibule was also a tool of temperature regulation, an intermediary space between inside and outside. The siting of a residence and treatment of the lot is also important. Northern elevations typically had few windows and were planted with coniferous trees to protect against northern winds in winter. Conversely, southern elevations usually contained more windows with deciduous trees that shaded the house in the summer and allowed solar heat in winter. Perhaps the most obvious passive energy feature that almost everyone has in their home are double hung windows. So uh, pop quiz for a seventh grade science question, does hot air rise or fall? Rises. It rises. So double hung windows allow for each sash to operate independently and by lowering the upper sash and raising the lower sash, hot air near the top of the room migrates out as cool air migrates in from the bottom. De facto air conditioning. With features like these, it is entirely possible to improve a home's energy efficiency without adversely impacting its historic fabric. Some of the most effective energy improvement techniques are reversible and as an added bonus, relatively inexpensive. But before making any changes, it's a good idea to schedule an energy audit, which will help determine where energy is being lost. Part of the energy assessment will be a blower door diagnostics test, which will depressurize the house and help determine where air and energy is being lost. The main benefit to an energy audit is to establish a baseline for energy performance so that any changes can be evaluated for their effectiveness. It's important to prepare for an energy audit ahead of time as it will include the entirety of the structure, attic to basement. So keep the following things in mind. So most of the things listed here is because of the blower door test and is meant to prevent anything hazardous from being circulated throughout the house. The technician would all, is also going to ask questions to help determine any specific areas of concern 
So you may want to familiarize with self, yourself with things like the year the house was built, the total square footage, the age of appliances and utilities, and if you notice any cold or hot spots. Usually the results of an energy audit offer some immediate, simple ways to improve energy efficiency. One that doesn't impact the house at all and should be the first step is to replace incandescent bulbs with LEDs. Even in homes where lighting may play an important part to the feeling of spaces, new advances in lighting provides for a variety of brightness settings and color temperature. Another is to simply conserve electricity by turning things off when they're not in use or installing timers. Another is to regulate thermostats, either by reducing heating and cooling by a degree or two or programming thermostats for when you are home and when you are not. For plumbing, fixing leaks and insulating pipes are some of the easiest methods to eliminate energy waste. Once a baseline is established, a homeowner can begin to plan for interventions through a variety of methods. I'm going to quickly go through all of those methods and point out ways that a homeowner can improve energy efficiency on their own and some treatments that require professional assistance. So first one is air sealing. Correcting air leaks provides one of the greatest returns on investment. It's inexpensive and if done correctly, reversible. Air leaks can account for anywhere between 5 to 40% of heating and cooling costs. So it's important to detect where the air is entering and exiting. The blower test as part of the energy audit helps to detect air leaks, but homeowners can also test for leaks themselves using a candle or a smoke test. Usually air leaks are found in the following areas. I'm not gonna read them all, but you know, from the exterior corners, outdoor faucets and utility inputs, joints between siding and chimneys, joints between foundations and siding materials, doors and window frames, attic doors, attic and basement floors, vents, door frames, baseboards, fireplace dampeners. There's a big list. So when sealing air leaks, the material that you use is important. The goal is to have it be reversible. Latex caulking is often the most expensive and user-friendly, uh, is the most inexpensive and user-friendly option. And as a bonus, it can be painted. While spray foam is sometimes recommended for sealing spaces, it's not preservation friendly, can stain, can off gas, and can mask other problems like mold. Usually the most effective areas to seal are the attic and the basement, both places where the majority of air enters and leaves the house. Other places to seal include around windows and doors, which can be accomplished through weather stripping, uh, which I'll talk about when I discuss windows. It's also important to remember that the goal is to reduce the amount of air infiltration while allowing the house to breathe as it was designed to, to avoid accumulating moisture. Insulation is a tricky subject. What is the, the base goal of insulation? Hold in the heat. Hold in the heat. Hmm. Anybody else? Keep so out heat. In, keep out heat, hold in heat, to slow down the transfer of heat, because heat's coming in, heat's coming out. Cold air comes in, hot air goes out. The purpose of insulation is to slow down that transfer of heat. Most houses were not insulated prior to 1940, and if they were, it was with things like newspaper and brick nogging. Some of you, if you were doing renovations, may have found some interesting historic newspapers. Insulation is commonly rated with an R factor, the resistance to transferring that heat. The higher the number, the better it insulates. As with air leaks, there are areas within historic homes that are good places to start to insulate. And in many homes, those places may have already been insulated in the past. Um, they include the basement, the attic, the pipes, and the ducts. The benefit of starting in any of these places is that there is typically no historic finishes to be disturbed. There's a variety of insulation materials to choose from, each with different R values and different applications. These are just some. Green are the ones that um, would provide, would have no damage to historic fabric. Yellow would be to use caution when installing them. Um, I did not include the red category, uh, which is spray foam. Um, as with air sealing, spray foam is not reversible and it should not be used on historic fabric. Also like air sealing, there is that question of moisture buildup when insulating a structure. As heat is not passing as easily through the structure, exterior materials remain colder and wetter for longer, which may lead to more maintenance and or deterioration. The question of wall insulation in a historic home is problematic as something has to be removed 
to allow for its installation. This, depending on the type of insulation, could be a small cut into plaster, removal of exterior shingle, or, and this is not recommended, removal of wall finishes. If too much insulation is added to an existing wall cavity, there is also the risk that plaster wall systems can fail, evidenced by broken keys or lath. Additionally, wood frame structures often contain a wall cavity that helps to keep interior wall systems dry. Adding insulation can sometimes cause unintentional moisture problems and rot. In the case of masonry structures, wall insulation can keep materials wetter for longer, which creates a similar moisture problem. Windows. One of my favorite parts and the part where we often get the most questions. Windows are the eyes to the soul of the building. I really believe that, I don't just say it, I walk the walk. Um, historic windows offer a number of benefits. They are often made of quality materials by quality craftsmen. They are repairable multiple times. They are custom made for your house and they provide an aesthetic quality that new windows can't. So if all of this is true, why do so many houses have replacement windows? I'll share an anecdote. These are my windows. A few months ago, I received a knock at my door from a perfectly pleasant gentleman who explained to me that my windows looked a little shabby and that I should consider replacing them. And wouldn't you know it, he happened to be a window salesman. <laughs> I told him that I was perfectly happy with my windows and that they operated just fine. He countered with telling me that they were not energy efficient. I countered with the point that Properly weatherized windows fitted with a storm are just as effective as a new insulated window. He countered that by saying that my triple track storms were unsightly. I said that while that may be true and that I wish I had the original wood storm windows, they were effective, did not require any major investment on my part, and were environmentally friendly. And they protected my historic windows, which was the goal. Aha, he said, but our windows are approved by the local historic district commission. And I will admit that at that point, my hospitality was growing thin. That may very well be the case, I said, but I'm afraid I have to tell you that the product you are selling is not of the same quality of my original windows, as the wood they are made out of is less dense, that they provide comparable energy efficiency to my existing windows at a significant cost, that each unit has a finite lifespan and is not repairable once its insulated glass fails, and as they are not custom made to match my existing windows in material, configuration, size, and munton profile, they will adversely affect the integrity of my National Register property. So thank you for the information. I am not interested. I wish you good luck, but not too much luck. <laughs> now, the only reason I was able to say that is because of what I do for a living. And it's possible that this type of scenario played out along the entirety of my street that day. And it's probably the reason it contributes to the number of homes that have replacement windows. All of those reasons he gave me to replace my windows sound reasonable. And the fact that they were approved by the local historic district commission, that sounds good, right? If you don't know the facts about replacement windows, how would you be able to counter that? The problem is that replacements are just that, they're replacements. They are to replace what has been lost. If you have windows that are in good shape or simply need some small repairs, there's no need to replace them. One of the main benefits to retaining historic windows is the practicality of repair. Almost any element can be fixed. Contemporary windows are units. That is, they are a closed system. And once that system is damaged, it is almost impossible to repair. Additionally, windows are almost always character-defining features of a building. You can see that there are a plethora of window types, indicative of different eras and styles. This is a list of 10 reasons of why it's a good idea to keep historic windows. Um, the highlights include what I just said. They're more economical. You have a better return on your investment. They're greener. They're functional. And they're absolutely unique to your building. I like to use the analogy of um, a car that's been in an accident. You need to replace a door panel or um, you know, a quarter panel or the trunk or the hood. And they make replacements and it will be professionally installed. But if any of you have ever replaced a door or a hood or a bumper, you know that it doesn't fit quite right 
it's always just slightly off because it's not made for the car. It's a replacement. It's what you will install if you've lost the original. So avoiding losing the original is the goal. Yeah. So what can you do to immediately improve the energy efficiency of your historic windows? Uh, window draft stoppers, like this one. Uh, insulated shades or curtains. Oops. No, stop. Back you go. Rope caulk or window draft shields. And above all, general maintenance. Paint your wood sashes, spot fill glazing. Keep sashes sliding smoothly and monitor the sash cords. And if they wear out, replace them. There are more intensive energy efficiency measures that should be undertaken by a professional, which include things like the metal weather stripping, which involves um, either repairing or installing um, a groove within the sash, or installing storm windows. Both of these items need to be custom fitted for the best result, so it's a good idea to get someone experienced. Preservation Connecticut does have a directory of professionals, sorted by category. Um, doors are similar to windows, though I don't quite think that they're the eyes of the building, maybe the mouth, um, but in any case, the same reasons for keeping historic windows apply to doors. Better materials, custom fit, less waste, and they're a work of art. And like windows, People are going to suggest that you replace them. I got this last week in the mail. The same treatments for windows are similar for doors and include regular maintenance, such as painting and patching, and the installation of weather stripping. There's also the option of a storm door, which should be chosen carefully so as not to detract from the historic door. I talked earlier about the inherent energy saving features that were built into historic homes because fuel sources weren't as plentiful and modern cooling didn't exist. Now that these systems do exist, many people have grown accustomed to them. Given also the discussion we had about insulation and moisture, it is also not the wisest idea to create an interior space that's say 50 degrees when the exterior temperature is 90 degrees. This is a hyperbole, but the general principle is the same. It is possible to create a climate controlled space in historic homes, but it is unrealistic or and undesirable for the health of the house to expect to create a hermetically sealed environment with a new HVAC system. What should be desired and expected is to integrate a system into a home by utilizing its inherent climate control characteristics coupled with new reversible technology. Generally, uh, installing new pipes or ductwork should be avoided if there is infrastructure already in place. Uh, as an example, the furnace shown is a natural gas furnace hot water heater, which is connected to existing radiators. The only major change to improve the efficiency here was to remove the oil burning furnace and conventional hot water tank. In regards to cooling, when there is no existing ductwork to use, high velocity mini ducts are an option as they are smaller and flexible compared to traditional ductwork and require less intervention into historic fabric. And if it is seasonal cooling, room air conditioners, which vent through a small tube out a window, are more effective at cooling as they are positional and do not damage any historic fabric. So we just went through all the ways that you can conserve energy. So let's take a look about some alternative sources of creating energy. A significant question when it comes to energy efficiency is the introduction of solar and it has both detractors and supporters. A typical residential solar installation relies on solar voltaic panels, usually installed on a roof, but could also be installed in a ground mounted array. Solar installations have the possibility to negatively impact above ground resources and below ground resources. So therefore placement becomes key. General guidance is that panels, if installed on buildings, should be placed on a non-public facing slope, usually either on the side or the rear, or placed on a non-historic structure like an addition or a non-historic outbuilding. For ground-mounted arrays, they should be placed in an area that will not disrupt the scenic view, and the area, if not already disturbed, should be evaluated for its potential to contain archaeological deposits. Geothermal heat pumps are another possible option for renewable energy for homes. They rely on the Earth's constant temperature for heating and utilize less energy than conventional furnace systems. Like ground-mounted solar arrays, the area of installation should be evaluated for archaeological sensitivity before installation. 
There are other types of renewable energy, including wind power, hydropower, and biomass fuel. But these are typically outside the realm of a single homeowner. However, our guide also includes information on each of these types if you're interested. Above all, it is important to remember that technology is ever evolving and that elements introduced into a structure may soon become obsolete and need to be removed. As an example, this monster of a furnace. And for you film buffs, that is the furnace from Home Alone. And this is the space in my home where the oil furnace was and a photo of my current furnace. Based on the footprint, it also looks like this is where the original coal furnace was. Because it's in the basement, no historic fabric was damaged. But what about this? Huh. <laughs> Those cuts were made for a very specific unit. And once it wears out, like my furnace did, what replaces it? Do you make another intervention? You can't put the historic fabric back. It's been lost for the sake of a 30-year-old appliance. Mm. My house was here long before me, and if I don't choose to upload my consciousness into the cloud, it will be here long after me. As a steward of a historic property, I enjoy my house, but I also have a responsibility to take care of it, just like you have a responsibility to take care of yours. And I also feel a responsibility to be a sustainable person, and many of you probably feel the same way. Luckily, being sustainable and being historic go hand in hand. So before embarking on energy upgrades, remember the following. Decide what you want to accomplish. Understand the historic character of your home. Evaluate the current conditions of your home and create a holistic plan that is primarily reversible. There is much more to read about sustainability in our handbook, which you can find on our website, as well as additional guidance from the National Park Service at nps.gov. So I hope you found this helpful. Uh, and if you have any questions, let me know. <laughs> Thank you, Marina. That was a, a great presentation. Can I ask a question? Yes. Sure. Um, can you expand a little bit on the, um, the 20 to 30 years to compensate for, like, let's say, replacing the windows? Um, Anyway, for destruction of a, a historic building, I'm sorry. So it's about embodied energy. So when you talk about um, the embodied energy of a building, you consider all of the energy that went into creating that building, which includes anything from, you know, um, harvesting wood to drying it, to transporting it, to hiring the labor to construct it. All of that is the energy that was used to create that building. Um, and then as that building is in service, you, you're basically, the amount of that energy by not having to create something else, that's expending that energy. So if you've already done that 200 years ago, it's basically use that energy, it's basically use that energy, you know, five, five times over. And does that, like, let's say if um, you've got a antique building and um, it's proposed for demolition, um, and the, the replacement building wants to have a certain LEED certification. Do you know um, how that impacts on the LEED certification of a replacement building? Do you have that info or know where I can get it? You know, I don't have it on off the top of my head. Stacy may know. I would think that, I don't know if demolition of an existing structure would contribute to that LEED certification. Maybe along the lines of like site preparation. Uh, okay. um, but I can certainly, I can certainly uh, do some digging and let you know. That would be hi, great. Yes. Hi. Hi, uh, uh, So I don't have the specific lead information, um, but to get that uh, calculation for the 30% and much more in-depth information about that, that's all available on the Preservation Forum through the National Trust. There are a number of studies there that give very specific information. Um, okay. even down to the region for replacement of houses. Okay. So you can go there. Um, I think I posted it at the end of this presentation. There's okay. a link to that. So. Okay, that'd be great. It's, um, it's just things we get asked fairly frequently and um, mm -hmm. something that's kind of pertinent right now. Yeah, and you want to be able to back it up. So. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. I had an Thank energy audit, audit about 10 years ago. Now, this is a 1765 center chimney that I moved from Rhode Island to Lyme, Connecticut. And mm -hmm. when I did so, I put an inch and three quarters polyisocyanurate foam in the walls, scribed in. Um, and I put in, for reasons that were not at the time, just because there was no place to put to put ducts, I put in seven zones. Uh, so I only heat the room I'm in. But when they came to do the energy audit, they had to come back with a more powerful fan. And <laughs> so they did the whole thing. Now, this is about 10 years ago. And they left saying, well, I probably qualified for a more intensive audit. <laughs> <laughs> But I hear, I mean, I've got, you know, I've got seven fireplaces and, mm -hmm. but they all have, you know, they all have, you know, proper uh, closing. Um, but I wonder, is it, is it worth getting another energy audit? I mean, they, they did caulk here and there. I've put interior storm windows on the most actively used rooms on the second floor. Um, but I just wonder, should I go round again in hopes that I'll get more advice or? So, I, I mean, you know, part of it is also that ongoing maintenance. Um, so, you know, you did put in interior storm. So that's a change to what was previously there during the energy audit. Um, the caulk, you know. No, you no, 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 no. They audited. All that was done when I rebuilt the house. When you rebuilt the house. Apart. Okay. Yeah, I took it all apart. You couldn't get on this road with the house. It's a pretty big center chimney. It's 32 by 42. You can, you know, much less get it across Beaver Brook. Uh, so all of that was done. And, and mm -hmm. it was still obviously rather leaky since their normal fan wouldn't do the job. Uh, I just wonder if, you know, a second round would, would be worth the doing. And, well, I, you know, if you don't want to invest in a second round, if you want to start, you can start with doing homeowner things like you can do a smoke test. Um, you can kind of set up your own uh, blower test, which is in the booklet. It tells you how to do it. You close everything, you put your exhaust fans on and you can kind of do a test by yourself. But it's been 10 years. It's a decade. And so there's certainly probably been some air infiltration. The house has probably settled or moved. Um, and so it may very well be worth it to you to have them come back. Okay. Thank you. And do, is, there, is there a way to, um, I mean, who does the energy audit? Are there recommendations for that? Um, there is. Okay. There is. And um, there is. And then there's also um, a list of options that, you know, if they um, recommend something that's pretty intensive, um, there are some funding sources. There's some funding sources available for things like solar. And then, of course, if you're in a house that's designated, uh, that's a designated property, either on the state or national register, um, our office also um, has a homeowner tax credit program um, that is a reimbursable program uh, for improvements um, to your house, which also includes things like um, doing energy efficiency upgrades that would not um, adversely impact historic fabric. Okay, so you do have like recommendations for people to perform the energy audit? There is okay. a, um, there's some hyperlinks within the document that will take you to it. Um, okay. And, and so that, that's primarily a service offered through um, the Connecticut Green Bank. Um, okay. And then once um, that information is given to you, um, are there people that are recommended to actually implement the, uh, the work that needs to be done? So they may, rec may make recommendations. Um, you as the homeowner, of course, have any choice to make any intervention in your home, however you'd like and through whomever you'd like. Um, so Preservation, Preservation Connecticut has the Preservation Directory of Qualified Official, right. of Qualified Personnel, especially right. for different types of work. Mm -hmm. um, so it's always good to keep that in mind that, you know, whoever you choose is someone who is used to and familiar with working right. with historic resources. Right. That's, that's a concern. When I did it, there were private firms that, that did the audits. And there were several around. I picked one of them. They were being paid by the power company but right and it's still the case today um you know we at the end of our presentation which will be online on our website after this again there will be a link to the green bank um right. website so that Wonderful. you'll have that there 
Great. Collaborate why spray foam is undesirable. Like if we were to put spray foam in the attic, um, would you be worried about the historic fabric in the attic? You would be. Yep. So um, spray foam, in addition to just not being reversible, so um, spray foam, its goal is to adhere. And so it actually, um, it latches into um, the surface of the building, uh, the surface of the material. So let's say wood, so it will go into all those wood pores. And the only way to actually to get it off, you'd have to mechanically chip it away. And then you would have to use some sort of chemical abrasive to fully remove it. It will always leave some sort of chemical stain. Um, in addition to that, it also may mask problems like um, moisture problems. So we were talking about moisture problems with insulation and air sealing. It may also mask those moisture problems, which could lead to mold and rot in framing. And you can't see it because it's spray foam. Also, you have to be careful who does it. I mean, I went into all of that and actually had arranged to have the walls all filled and discovered sometimes it just turns into a powder. And it depends upon the skill of the person who, who does the spraying. And fortunately, the guy who contracted with me moved to do a big job in New Hampshire and I had to fit in polycyanamide foam pieces by pieces in between the joists. But I was warned and, and I had a neighbor who had to move out of the house because there was, uh, it exuded a gas that caused an allergic reaction. So, but I was told at the time by the people who, who initiated that scheme that you had to be very, very careful who trained the people who do the work. Thank you. I just want to say, Marina, you did a great job, and um, I <laughs> and I feel like I need your rebuttal on the windows um, with the work that I do with the Norwich Historic District Commission, because we've got so many people who want to replace their windows, and um, it's a struggle. And I'm well, Marina, you know my recent battles with a couple of those initiatives where yeah. we've got some homeowners and contractors who just think you know replacing their wood windows is the right way to go, and so I'm on that constant battle with them. Um, I know that there's some preservation briefs, but I love like your just quick like top 10 reasons to save your windows. Like, can you send that to me? Because that would be hot, awesome. <laughs> it's in our book um, and it's not ours. Um, we, let me actually give you the full source. Good thing I had the book open. Um, <laughs> it was like some window ladies who, who redo windows, I think, aren't they? Is it, it might be the New England um, Association of Window, um, there's a great association of, of, um, of window, of, of historic window um, craftsmen. Okay. And I think that, let's see, but it's all, it's all in um, the book. Let's see. Yeah, Re Re Regan, I'm, I'm sorry, Brad Scheid, I'm coming late to this, but uh, the other issue uh, I've noticed when people come in and talk windows, they usually don't have insulation anywhere else in their house. And uh, <laughs> you can usually insulate, I, I mean, usually what I do is I don't necessarily say no to windows till you walk over there and then you notice they haven't insulated uh, in the basement, uh, the bottom floor, they haven't insulated in, in the, the attic, uh, you know, and there's, there's lots of research out there that a lot of the energy loss is going through the roof, not through windows. So you can actually, um, you know, I, I mean, again, it's a hard argument. Okay, they come, <laughs> they come, they already got their Anderson windows, they got everything set up. But, uh, you know, sometimes you can kind of appeal to them that you could probably, you know, maybe check something else out before you spend all the money on the windows and, and see, you know, doing a good blower door test, seeing where the energy is really being lost. And nine out of 10 times, I, I swear to God, nine out of ten times, they don't have any insulation in the attic, don't have any insulation in the basement, uh, or the sides of the basement or the walls. Um, you know, there's just a lot of different ways to scalp it besides just uh, those windows. But it's a tough argument. I agree. So, <laughs> these, um, we, these guys even we, offer 12 over 12s. I mean, before I moved this house, there were just two over two, so I'd have 12 over 12s 
made because that's clearly what it was called for. But do these guys who offer replacement windows actually offer 12 over 12s? Um, yeah, that would be a custom job. It'll cost you a fortune. So, yeah. you, you know, I mean, really, it's about what you want to spend. And uh, the, the replacement windows, uh, you know, well, Marina can tell you, I mean, there, there are ways to salvage your window and insulate area all around it. I mean, it's worth a shot. You know, if you're going to spend, you know, 50, 60 grand or whatever it is on all these windows, maybe it's worth a shot that you don't spend it right away. You do other measures and see how the winters hold up in a couple of years. And, you know, you're not going to talk. People want to do the windows. I've never been able to talk them out of it, but I've been able to at least appeal to reason sometimes. Uh, but, yeah, they'll make a 12 or 12. They'll, they'll make anything you want, but they'll cost you a fortune. You know, that's really what will happen. And preservation, can I? Yeah, sorry, sorry Jenko. Um, and we try to offer window workshops once, maybe twice a year for homeowners so you can see what the process is to deglaze the window and make repairs. And that it, it if you have a little bit of training and some uh, determination and patience, you can probably do a lot of the repairs yourself. We had a session scheduled for May that got postponed, so we're hoping we'll be able to bring that in September or October. So watch our, our announcements for that. Yeah, so um, actually Regan, um, Regan has experience reglazing windows. Yes, um, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's not impossible. And it's the New England Window Restoration Alliance. That's the group, New England Window Restoration Alliance. Thank you, I'm writing that down. Yeah, no problem. And again, you can go to our website and you can download, um, you can download the booklet. It's uh, chapter five, Windows and Doors. Is it on like the homepage, Marina, or like where exactly? It's in it resources. Um, okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. That, that, group, that group doesn't have the uh, advertising budget Anderson Windows does. <laughs> you know, so, so you, you gotta fight through and fight for the information, you really do. Is there, Thank you guys. is there a general thing about what to do in a basement? I've never worried about the basement. But, uh, it depends on the basement. Um, it depends on if the basement, you know, has a poured concrete slab or if it's got an earthen floor or if it has stone walls or if it's just a crawl space. Um, it all depends. Part of it is about moisture. Part of it is about allowing that circulation while, while you know, really controlling the amount of cold air infiltration that would create a stack effect because cold air will come in and the hot air will come out the attic if the attic is not insulated. Um, so it's really all a balance. Um, you know, if you have a basement that has stone walls um, and you're concerned about cold air infiltration through there, sometimes the best thing to do is actually just um, repoint the walls if the, um, if the mortar joints have deteriorated that helps to seal a lot of air infiltration. And then also, you know, kind of that, that edge along the sill where there would be a gap between where the house sits on the foundation. Um, and the other thing is that if your mechanicals are in the basement, um, that creates kind of that passive environment. So you don't really want to insulate the rest of it, the rest of the house from that passive environment because it's not, it's not um, an unregulated um, area. It's not like a, an empty crawl space. Um, so you wanna, you wanna make sure that, you know, that, that kind of temperate environment is allowed to continue to breathe and circulate. So it really all depends on what, what resources are there. Okay. Yeah, and if again, you don't, that goes in more detail. Yeah, I just add to that, that's well said. Uh, if you don't insulate the attic, uh, you, you, know, you can probably see all the heat. <laughs> Escaping your roof. Uh, yeah, it's a so cedar, as, as, as it's a cedar shingle the, roof. So, you know, that's got a cedar shingle roof has to breathe. I mean, yeah, no, it has to breathe. But if you don't insulate, the heat rises, right? So it, it'll just go up and it, it finds passages and ways out. And and you basically the heat just goes right out what what you're what you're using. Right, uh, insulation. I have insulation either between the ceiling and the floor or the front of rooms or 
on the floor of the attic. I've got about eight inches of fiberglass. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, no, that's and, good. And so if there's, if there's an unregulated, so it's the, it's the converse of the basement. So if your utilities are in the basement, odds are they're not in the attic. So if you have an unregulated uh, attic space, you put the insulation on the floor of the attic. Because again, it's a really easy way. There's no historic fabric. You can just lay it down, either rigid board or bad insulation. And that helps to provide a barrier in the climate controlled space of the house. Okay, correct. While also preventing ice dams. Mm -hmm. Excellent, Marina. Well, thanks, Brad. <laughs> Uh, ice dams are crazy. Everybody says, oh, why oh, are these ice dams? But Marina just solved your problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had terrible ice dams at the boarding house at um, the Preservation Connecticut a few years ago. It caused a lot of damage. I tried tossing ice, salt-filled stockings up over the edge to get them to drain. I think it's worth, even with a tall, you know, two, two and a half story center chimney, it's worth having one of those long rakes. But I haven't gotten one, I have to admit. There are people who advertise, they provide that service. So we just have a couple of minutes left if there were any other questions or comments for Marina. Hi, this is Robert Scheinman uh, with the Whitneyville Cultural Commons. Um, we're a historic preservation organization that uh, owns a historic church in Hamden, Connecticut. And I was just wondering if there's any advice yeah, we you can give. with your roof. Yeah, you did. Know that you. was great. <laughs> um, hey, give, it, give us a shout out there. <laughs> yeah, last year the Connecticut Trust helped us replace the roof on the historic church. It was wonderful. We were able to get it done, uh, needed to be done after 30 years of the old roof on there. Um, so I'm just sort of wondering if there's any way to frame some of the restoration work and the sustainability of that for um, grants that are centered around sustainability rather than historic preservation. If you have any advice about how to sort of pitch these projects in that way so that we can have some access to additional funds. So there are there is funding available for energy efficiency upgrades usually it's targeted primarily towards the residential market um and that is also in our booklet it's primarily sponsored through connecticut green bank and um also through the it's a partnership with the public utility companies that being said um you know those those projects would come under review because it's um, state and or federal funding so our office would review that um, for compliance about any effects to historic properties. So it's there and it's integrated into the booklet. Um, it's, it, it's just that this is particularly targeted towards residential. Um, however, most of those principles, especially with your, when you're dealing with, you know, uh, you know, wood frame structure of a certain vintage and you are dealing with things like, you know, how do you create a climate controlled environment or how do you introduce a new mechanical system? Um, most of that stuff would apply. The issue is really more about how you take those unique circumstances and evaluate it before you start to prescribe treatment. So that so that stuff is available. Um, you can use it in conjunction. You, well, you would really, because it's state funding, you can't use it in conjunction with some of our financial incentive programs. Um, but we do offer, as you may be aware, we do offer a historic restoration fund grant um, for nonprofits and municipalities to do restoration work. And some of that work can be towards making energy efficiency upgrades. Yeah, we have a few problems with some of those grants. Our mortgage holder doesn't want to allow us to put a lien, uh, to put the easement on the property. So we have to search for some alternate funding sources. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Robert, uh, so. you, you should be connecting to Green Bank. Green Bank has a lot of programs. They, they are very expert in what they're talking about. And they also have pre-development planning money too. Uh, I, uh, you know, you're more, you're not, you're a, you're more of a commercial than a residential. Yeah. So I, you know, they do all, all types of work there. So I, I really would connect with them. They're, they're really good and they're really knowledgeable. Okay. And, and they do have access to small contractors and you know, all kinds of things. They're, they're, they really aim to please. Great. Thanks. I will. Great, thanks Brad. Thanks Robert for the question. We are just about out of time. Um, 
Marina, thank you so much for the presentation and all of your knowledge. <laughs> that was fantastic. And so the resources up on your website, what we can do right. is send the PowerPoint out to everyone and we'll send a link to that on your website. If, you. if you didn't register for this, um, program. If you want to just shoot an email to contact at preservationct.org, we can get all of these resources to you. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Please, um, please consider being a member of Preservation Connecticut if you're not already. We rely really heavily on our members to be um, part of our team in the communities to inform us of preservation activities and be advocates with us and also provide um, private funds as we are a private membership organization as well. And next week we're taking the week off for 4th of July mini vacation, but we'll be back with our noon chats the following week and we're going to focus on um, historic black churches, saving faith, preserving historic black churches in the 21st century. So we're really excited to talk with our grant recipients and um, Todd Levine, who administers the Freedom Trail at the Connecticut SHPO, will be joining us for that program as well. So thanks everyone for joining us. It was great to see you all and have a great day. Thanks. Thank you, Marina. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Where am I? There we go.